floating. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue. On behalf of the Mark Twain House and Museum, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. Where we're talking about the matter of Black lives um, with some wonderful panelists, uh, the editor of that book and, and some contributors to it. Um, I'll be introducing them in just a moment. I have some very, very brief housekeeping remarks to make before um, turning things over to our panel. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you all for being here and um, for supporting the Mark Twain House and Museum by attending our virtual programs. Um, and we're in our Crowdcast platform, which we've been using um, since the pandemic began. So I see that you're already chatting away in the chat. Please continue to chat. Um, that's part of the fun of the virtual programs. Um, and uh, it's really nice to be able to connect in that way. However, if you happen to have a question for the Q&A section at the end of our program, rather than put it in the chat, if I could ask you please to put that in the ask a question section at the bottom of the screen, that'll make that part of the program go that much more smoothly. So thank you in advance for doing that. While we're looking at the bottom of the screen, I'd ask you just to raise your eyeballs a tiny bit and look at that um, uh, long green button that talks about your uh, support is vital. It's very important to all of us nonprofit organizations to have the support of our constituencies, our audiences throughout the pandemic, which has taken its toll on all of us. And I'm really pleased to say that tonight, if you make a donation, it's being split equally between the Mark Twain House and Museum, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, and the Amistad Center for Art and Culture. And um, I promise you on behalf of the staffs and the boards of all of those organizations that every single penny is very deeply appreciated and every single penny is put to very, very good use indeed. So thank you in advance for that support as well. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the link in the chat and I'll repost it um, so that it's right in front of you again um, to purchase a copy of tonight's book, The Matter of Black Lives. Now we know that you can get this book elsewhere. We're no dummies, but if you do um, order this book through that link, know that you get a signed copy, first of all, and also know that your purchase supports the Mark Twain House and Museum. And again, that support is very important to us. and We appreciate it very much. So please consider uh, clicking that button and buying the book. Um, I do want to take a moment at this, uh, to thank our sponsors. Tonight's program, like so many of our programs, is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by Connecticut Public WNPR. And it's produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, who was a longtime and beloved trustee of the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, this is one of many, many um, virtual programs that the museum has offered and is offering during the pandemic. And we can plan to continue offering them for many months to come um, for a full list of those programs, please visit us at marktwainhouse.org. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Kimberly Kersey, who has done a number of these uh, programs with us throughout the pandemic. Um, she's a wonderful friend of the museum. She's also the executive director of the Amistad Foundation for Art and Culture. So welcome to Kimberly. Our panelists are Doreen St. Felix, a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2017. She was named the magazine's television critic in 2019. Before that, she was a culture writer at MTV News. Her writing has appeared in The Times Magazine, New York, Vogue, The Fader, and Pitchfork. And in 2017, she was a finalist for a National Magazine Award for Columns and Commentary. And in 2019, she won in that category. Vincent Cunningham joined the New Yorker as a staff writer in 2016. Since 2019, he has served as theater critic for the magazine. And in 2020, he was a finalist for a National Magazine Award for his profile of the comedian Tracy Morgan. I remember that. His writing on books, art, and culture has appeared in the Times Magazine, the Times Book Review, Vulture, Fader, and McSweeney's, and others. Uh, and for McSweeney's, he wrote a column called Field Notes from Gentrified Places. Cunningham <laughs> previously served as a staff assistant at the Obama White House. And Jelani Cobb has been contributing to The New Yorker since 2012. He became a staff writer in 2015. He writes frequently about race, politics, history, and culture. His most recent book, I should say, is The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress. He won the 2015 mm -hmm. Sidney Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis Journalism for his columns on race, the police, and injustice. 
He teaches at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. So everybody, please join me in extending a great big Mark Twain House welcome to Jelani, Vincent, and Doreen, and Kimberly. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you for those uh, introductions. And we look forward to you joining us back again at the end of the program for questions and answers. Thank you. I'm going to sit back and enjoy with everybody else. I'll see you in a little bit. Wonderful. Well, welcome to our guests tonight. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I really enjoyed the book. Um, and, uh, you know, Jelani Cobb, thank you for pulling together this anthology. I, I know for me, it gave me an opportunity to um, revisit some pieces that I hadn't read in a while. And probably more importantly, it introduced me to some new writers and voices that I hadn't heard before. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about. So uh, thank you for that. So talking about um, the book, um, The Matter of Black Lives, um, the anthology is broken down into seven parts um, with essays covering a wide range of topics, um, all with a common theme about race in America. In addition to being um, one of the editors of the book, three of your essays are included. And in your individual essay, The Matter of Black Lives, um, you remind us of Alicia Garza's social media post titled, A Love Letter to Black People. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about Garza's words in that post and how it shaped the Black Lives Matter movement? Sure. I mean, in some ways, you know, this is where the conversation begins. Um, and, you know, let me begin by saying, you know, I'm very uh, happy to be able to have this conversation with the Mark Twain House, uh, as I have reiterated, although I don't think that either Vincent or Doreen know, but I literally lived across the street from the Mark Twain House when I lived in Hartford. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I was a regular at, you know, the Twain House events and they were like, is this guy like sleeping on the couches here? Like he's going <laughs> around. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to participate um, in this discussion, especially with, um, you know, two of my uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, and so, you know, in, you know, in, when we when we do you know stories very often the title is the last part and mm -hmm. that comes together and sometimes that's like a very extended process uh, and you know <laughs> Vincent is nodding but because we'll go through something and you know the editors will be like oh it's not quite right and then it's like there's a very precise word ratio um, that they have for titles and and so it can be it's like writing haiku uh, and we were trying to come up with a title for that that profile of Alicia Garza. And it just occurred to me like, oh, the matter of black lives, you know, um, because she had been so integral to that phrase, um, you know, and that noise you hear probably in the background is my very unruly children um, who I think are corralled and won't you know, show up on camera, but they might. So, this, so we're very clear about that. Um, so uh, when we were, we worked, when I was working on that profile of her, uh, I went back to that that post that she made, and this was in the aftermath of George Zimmerman's acquittal uh, in the murder of Trayvon Martin. Uh, and she had written, you know, that that our lives matter, uh, and you know that was the kind of distillation of the phrase that came to be Black Lives Matter, uh, and along with her co-founders, um, you know, Patrice Cullors and ooh. I'm leaving somebody out. <laughs> so, um, but but uh, you know when they came up with that phrase, what I thought was important about it, um, and I still think is important about it, is that it, you were distilling down what a dizzying array of activists and intellectuals and movements have all had in common, which was simply the attempt to make it to make a world in which Black people's lives matter. Uh, in which our existence is not, you know, dismissed as superfluous, and that we're not disposable uh, as human beings. And so that was kind of where the phrase came from, um, and where subsequent the kind of play on that phrase came to be the title of the profile of her, uh, and then the profile of the the title of the book as well. Right. Um, the book itself begins with the premise um, that following James Baldwin's 1962 essay, "Letters from a Region in My Mind." The New Yorker realized that race and social justice justice was uh, indeed of interest uh, to its readership, 
and there began a more um, purposeful inclusion and coverage of Black America. Um, mm. I love your um, statement in the book, uh, not quite Ebony magazine, but no longer quite so pale. Um, right. I underlined that, <laughs> that, that line there. Um, can you share with us your journey with The New Yorker and what led to the idea for this anthology? Sure. Um, and I mean, I think we should answer that in three parts because, you know, it, it wasn't a kind of simple transition, you know, from Baldwin's piece. You know, Baldwin's piece stands out um, because there was very little that preceded it that was so overtly, um, you know, direct and directly tackling the issue of race in American society, you know, especially for what the New Yorker's readership has historically been. Um, and so, you know, I kind of, one of the things that's amusing to me is, you know, thinking of the unsuspected, uh, you know, unsuspecting subscriber going to their mailbox in Greenwich or the Upper East Side or, you know, some similar locale and opening this manifesto from James Baldwin, which, you know, really reads like the counts in an indictment. Uh, and he's, he's especially indicting white liberals, you know, people who thought that they were good on the issue of race. Uh, and so uh, after, after that, it did open up a space and, you know, Charlene Hunter Galt became the first black staff writer uh, at the New Yorker eventually. That didn't happen like kind of immediately in the aftermath. And then, uh, you know, Jervis Anderson and Jamaica Kincaid and an array of voices that came after that uh, of people in, in, you know, especially like into the 1990s where you began to get that why one reason why that collection is so slanted in the direction of the 90s you know toward the contemporary work because that was when we started to get a kind of critical mass of people writing and thinking about these issues not all of them african-american of course there's you know some really great work um, by colleagues uh, who are not african-american um, from a variety of backgrounds you know that that also i think ably um, tackles these issues and these themes um, and so, as a matter of fact, one of the earlier pieces is, you know, Rebecca West, uh, who wrote the uh, story about the lynching in South Carolina, uh, and so, which we thought was important too. Uh, but for me, I started contributing in 2012. The first thing that I ever wrote about was Trayvon Martin, um, which at the time was just a kind of news blip. It wasn't what it came to be in terms of its really global significance. Um, and, you know, I unfortunately came at a time when social media and the presence of cell phone cameras was making this, these kinds of reckonings very common uh, in terms of you know, the number of incidents because you know, there was Trayvon, uh, you know, there was Ferguson you know, right after that. There were the killings, you know, Renisha McBride, Eric Garner, like the whole array of people, Sandra Bland, we walked through a whole list uh, and I just kind of found those names on my slate. And I wound up chronicling a lot of that. Um, and at some point, I think I was very ambivalent about it. And at some point I decided that this was a thing and that it was important to bear witness about it. Um, and that I was going to address these recurrent themes as ably as I could. Um, and it's like, this is not the only thing I was interested in, but it wound up being a major theme in the work that I was have, have been producing at the New Yorker. So when George Floyd died, um, or when George Floyd was killed, you know, we began this conversation about what would be the most responsible way of, of responding to it. You know, one thing is that we republished the publication, the New Yorker republished Baldwin's Letter from a Region in My Mind, um, which if people don't know, Letter from a Region in My Mind is essentially the fire next time, but became the book, the fire next time is most of it. Um, and from there, we got into a conversation, David Remnick and I, about what a project like this could look like. And then we started kind of tossing around you know, ideas and uh, Aaron Overby, the archivist, you know, sent a long list of work um, that historically grappled with these kinds of questions. And over the course of, you know, many conversations uh, on late on Tuesday nights, you know, we pulled together what, what became the final version of this book. Great. You know, as I was reading the book, I was struck by two things. Um, first of all, you'd already hinted at it, the diversity of voice in this book, um, but also, um, the fact that the essays are not ordered chronologically. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship of the writers and how you place them in the book. Oh, 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll say this and then I will like be quiet because I'm really interested in hearing from my colleagues. But I, um, so the thing is, it, it was awkward. And there were things that we knew. There were people who we knew were going to be in it. Um, but it was a question of what, you know, from them would be in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, with Vincent, we had the same sort of kind of dilemma. With Doreen, we had the dilemma. Um, we we're going back and forth on pieces. I, I wanted as little of me as possible in this collection. Uh, and David and I were fighting about that. And he was like, no, this has to stay in and so on. And, you know, because I was like congenitally incapable of judging something of mine as worthy of inclusion. Um, and so one, interestingly enough, David did the same thing because he had this astoundingly good profile of Aretha Franklin that, um, that he pulled and I put back in and he pulled and I put back in. <laughs> then I just realized I wasn't going to win this fight. But David was like, no, 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 no. You know, I can't, I can't be in this. And so, um, and so I still feel that if we have like regrets and it sounds like I'm kissing up to the boss, but I really if I have regrets about this, it, it would have been that I wanted to include that piece in it. And so uh, we just kind of sorted through and started thinking about the things that, um, that highlighted themes that weren't necessarily, um, you know, overt things that talked about kind of the depth and richness of Black people's experiences in the country, um, and that it wasn't a simple recitation of woe um, and travail. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, you know, led to the pieces, you know, particularly, you know, um, Doreen's piece on Ken Kendrick Lamar, um, where she's really kind of chronicling his brilliance and his, his standing, his niche in, uh, you know, American culture, not necessarily simply hip hop. Uh, and, you know, Vincent's piece, which we thought was one of the things we immediately knew um, was his piece on the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, which we thought that has to go, <laughs> you know, that was like an easy, a easy one. Um, and then uh, we had really interesting discussions about, uh, you know, the piece that he did on prep for prep. Uh, and, you know, Vincent and I have both have in common that we both did really in, involved long form pieces about that related to our own educations. You know, I did something on Jamaica High School uh, and I was like happy to have Vincent's piece in because that allowed me to cut my Jamaica High School piece. So yeah, we don't have to have my piece. We have Vincent's piece on here. Well, that's great. And uh, thank you for that. And I, I think we, um, let, let's pull in Doreen and Vincent to the conversation. Um, starting with Doreen, I, I have to start by saying, I, I really enjoy your writing style. I love just the freshness of your voice and the directness of your voice. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank um, you so much for saying that. Yeah, the, the piece that's in the anthology on um, the autofictions of Kendrick Lamar. Um, I have to ask you about the title of that piece. And if you could just talk a little bit about the word autofictions and how that relates to what you wrote. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think around the time that I, so that piece is essentially, it's an expanded concert review um, of Kendrick Lamar during his DAM tour, which I think was in 2000. 17, so nearly five years ago. And that was an era where people were talking a lot about autofiction and literature, this idea that you create a fictional style that like um, represents the mundanity of life like in the most minute detail. Um, and it's funny because I'm kind of like realizing that this piece presages um, the culture's general sense of Kendrick Lamar as someone who's like, more related to literature than not, because then of course he wins um, the Pulitzer not too long after. Um, and I was kind of grappling with his um, plate of persona or pos persona, excuse me. Kendrick Lamar is someone who is many people at once in his music. Um, there's Kung Fu Kenny, there are other kind of like identities that um, he inhabits in order to kind of be this griot figure within the various communities that his music tends to represent. That's a fraught word, which I think the anthology um, presents a lot of essays about um, the complications of authenticity and how the assumption that in order to have 
a work of Black art be valuable, it has to convey a one-to-one -one authenticity with real life. And Lamar was an interesting figure to me, as with many rappers, he um, was sort of caught between wanting to be a reporter, giving us that minutiae, but also um, being a myth maker. And so that essay sort of grapples with um, the paradoxes within not only his art and his presence, but also within um, the art of hip hop and performance writ large. I have to say, as I was reading it, just the, um, like your, your choice of word, the visual that was being created, it really, it painted a picture of actually being at the concert and you could kind of visualize so much. It was such a, um, uh, such a whole picture that was, it was painted with words. And, and I really appreciated that. Were you actually attending the concert? Is, is that based on your attendance at a concert or compilation of interactions with, with the artist? Absolutely. So I had been assigned the piece as kind of a straight concert review. And I think a great thing about being at the New Yorker is you can kind of bend mm. the assignments to what you're good at. And um, I hadn't written about Kendrick before, and I was interested in sort of like um, giving uh, his performances in particular, not necessarily the music or the albums, but the performances, a kind of biography. And as I was going through, he's someone who I'd been seeing in concert for nearly a decade at that point. I think the first time I saw him was at school. I went to a private white institution. I went to Brown University and I just have this memory of during the spring weekend concert, Kendrick is singing, I mean, excuse me, he's performing his song about alcoholism and there's all these just like white bros completely wasted, like not paying attention to the lyrics and I, <laughs> had <been. laughs> and I think that's like um an experience that a lot of uh fans of rap will go through when they see these performers where there's this um attraction to the spectacle by a lot of their fans and like a complete misapprehension of what the music is actually saying and so with someone like Kendrick you know who is so steeped in the black arts movement so steeped in culture you're like well how is that um being reflected in the evolution of his persona and I think that once we see to pimp a butterfly and then damn which was kind of like this lower shift down key coda to, to pimp a butterfly that I was like very interested in um, I thought, okay, now is the time to kind of give um, this mid-career artist at that point uh, a kind of biography. Talk a little bit about your, your writing process. Like, where does it begin and how do you know when you're finished with a piece? <laughs> I think you never know when you're finished with the piece. Um, <laughs> luckily, there are these terrible um, constructions called deadlines that sort of force us to be done. <laughs> Um, I was gonna say when the when the fact checkers let you go. <laughs> That's when you're done. Um, but yeah, I guess my process initially had been heavily influenced by um, the time during which I cut my teeth as a writer, which is to say, I started writing for the internet in a way that I don't even know I was necessarily cognizant of. Um, I graduated school in 2014. And at that point at my university, I didn't feel like I was at all accepted in the nonfiction community because I wanted to write mm -hmm. critically about race and performance. And there was an idea that that wasn't writerly, right? That that was more like, oh, you should be in Africana studies. Um, and so I didn't have the pedigree, even though I went to this really vaunted institution. And so I kind of learned um, maybe a more irreverent way of doing criticism because it was based um, on these like uh, kind of back channel blogs and tumblers that we would read at the time. And so for me, I think a lot of editors at the magazine, the advice that they have is that an essay should kind of just make one argument and then make that argument over and over in different ways. Um, and so I tend to start with that. I, I tend to start with, okay, what is the argument that I'm trying to lay out in this piece of criticism? I tend to only do criticism. My colleagues mm -hmm. are all over the map and much more talented than I am. Um, once I get there, I'm a big drafter. Uh, after I've done research, I tend to do three or four passes before I send it to an editor. For me, it's much more 
how the ideas come, that's very mysterious. But I can tell you the very technical um, kind of guardrails that I set up so that I don't end up spinning and spiraling, which I mean is endemic to the writing process itself, mm. but in particular when you're writing about things like race and performance and gender, which come a lot, which come up a lot um, in the work that I do. Could you say what what might be the biggest risk that you've taken as a writer to date? The biggest whether it's on topic or critique you know I know sometimes with um, those types of pieces I don't know if you have a concern about going too far or being too deeply critical um I you know I don't have that concern I think it's funny I've been I think we've all in this virtual room been mourning the death of Greg Tate critic extraordinaire this week mm -hmm. and I think if there was one thing I learned from him um it was that it's not worth doing unless you take a risk and I think whenever I publish, I mean, sometimes I publish pieces that I feel less than happy with. And I think usually it's because I haven't kind of gone out on that limb. Mm -hmm. um, and so I try to, whether it's in regards to style or pulling um, references that might be off kilter or sort of resisting, I think, the demands of black excellence that are put on generations since the inception of this country, I always try to just be as honest as possible. Um, for me personally, I don't think it's worth it unless you're challenging prevailing ideas, but also challenging yourself. Now, Jelani, I know that um, certainly you were interested in, in including Doreen's work. Were there other pieces of hers that you considered and how did you decide which one you wanted to include for this anthology? Yeah, there were a lot. And actually an earlier version um, of the anthology included a piece that now I uh, you know, have regrets that we didn't include. And that was um, her profile of Virgil Abloh, um, mm -hmm. which, which, which actually had no reflection um, on Doreen, but like a lot of the times we were like, do we have too many profiles? Do we have too many letters? You know, we're kind of going like, oh, well, we can keep this piece from this writer if we cut this piece and we go back and forth with this. And so it was like a, a, a process of like almost like jigsaw puzzling. Um, and so we kept the Kendrick Lamar piece, but I, I, I did kind of wonder, um, kind of like your reflections about, and obviously I read what you wrote about after Virgil passed, but kind of what your, your thinking was in writing that piece, that immediate moment when you know this person is gone and there's this thing that you've written um, about him, kind of what, your, what went through your mind. Yeah, it was my first experience of having a subject that I had spent extensive time with passing away. Um, and I think Virgil Abloh, for those who might not be familiar, um, was a creative director of Louis Vuitton men's, um, but also was just more so a kind of like gonzo figure in the black commercial arts for some 10 to 15 years. He began as Kanye West's creative director and then sort of like spun out and made this like incredible also um, con controversial body of work. Um, and I think, I remember feeling like slightly dissatisfied when the profile published because it was a piece that had to be included in the style issue of the magazine. So it had a peg, right? And I couldn't spend as much time as I wanted with this figure. And now I kind of think that the, I don't wanna say weaknesses of the piece, but the circumscription of it oddly kind of um i think is apt because this is a life that was cut completely short right if ablo had lived for 40 years longer it might be that his um work as a fashion designer wouldn't even really be that um integral to his uh you mm -hmm. know his overall um you know creative mm -hmm. practice so it's a feeling of ambivalence. I think I feel like strangely about it. I think that um, Ablo is someone who truly is one of one for better and for worse. And I think he's a figure that butts up against um, some of the more like treacly or sincere ideas that we have about like making art that reflects our race. And I'm really fascinated by that. You know, people who, um, who kind of go against the grain. And yeah, it's just a tragedy that we've lost him as, you know, at the age of, I think he was 41. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. 
Um, Vincent, I, I want to pull you into the conversation as well. And I have to start by saying um, I, I read A Darker Presence with really close attention. Um, the Amistad Center for Art and Culture, the institution that I lead, um, is a, a smaller version, a much smaller version of the National Museum of African American Art and Culture in DC. So you can imagine I was just fascinated with your conversation with Lonnie Bunch and some of the information that came out uh, you know, during that piece. Yeah. Um, I was really taken by uh, Lonnie's quote, um, this is not a black museum, this is a museum that uses one culture to understand what it means to be an American. Can you share for us what you believe um, this mm -hmm. particular museum means for African Americans? Well, you know, it's funny. I, it's it's because institutions are um, living beings in a way. I mean, this was part of we talked. One of my fears um, writing this piece because you know I, I wrote it most of it before the museum had opened, based on you know yeah. going on sort of um, being given access to it and talking to people that. Um, that uh, helps bring it into being, and you know, my the 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 ambivalence that I express in the piece, um, which was you know, it's a strange piece because um, the way the New Yorker is, everybody that reads the magazine understands this intuitively. There's like we have reported pieces that make up the the great majority of the sort of middle of the magazine, the great meat of the magazine, and then the critics pieces come at the end, and this piece is kind of straddles that line. I do a lot of reporting in the piece, but then it essentially is uh, an appraisal um, toward the end. And so back then, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know, but um, back then, my my worry was, my ambivalence, I guess, was you know to present facts, you know, as as any museum must, um, in an order that like takes chronology, takes theme, um, takes a lot of factors, takes the idea of history versus culture, which is of course baked into the name of the museum and is part of its sort of physical layout. Um, to present it all in one line um, without doing the work of interpretation necessarily, right? That interpretation um, takes on this great weight and um, uh, the, the issue of a verdict looms large. Um, and for me, any, um, any act of, uh, curation like that, any pr presentation of, of a history that must in its sort of putting forth be kind of artistic, like it just requires continual acts of interpretation. And that's, you know, to me as a critic, of course, like that's one of the things that to me is the great need that that's my impulse. Like I look around at all at phenomena and people and things and I like feel this need to synthesize them. So that's what I, um, uh, that was my concern there. Of course, now our colleague Kevin Young, a fantastic person, is um, the director of that of that institution. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting him to give me a, a fresh, fresh tour. Tickets. Looking forward to tickets. Tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, that was a, a really. Uh, that was my first big. Uh, that was my first long form piece. I had done something and I had written a, a short piece about Prince. Um, when he died in the talk of the town section. Um, but this was my first big, uh, longer piece that appeared in print. So, um, you know, my, my bigger worry was like, you know, doing okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was um, really fun to put that together. Yeah, can I ask Vincent and Doreen something? Yeah. So, you know, I have always viewed myself, or at least in recent years, I've viewed myself as part of a like middle tier of people. Um, because, you know, given you know, Doreen's nod to Greg Tate, you know, whose absence is, uh, is stunning, and it's a, you know, titanic loss. But the loss is also, I think, sharpened by the fact that I'm not sure how many people know what we lost. And I feel like, you know, he was 12 years older than me. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole tier of um, Black artists, uh, intellectuals, critics, uh, filmmakers, you know, maybe not so much musicians, but people who were in other areas of creative art for whom it was just a given that they would not be recognized by the wider world. Um, and, you know, so, so Greg never had a MacArthur, which he's, he's obviously qualified for. Um, he never got a Pulitzer. Uh, he never got a Book Credit Circle Award. You know, he was almost criminally under laureled 
um, as a writer. And I feel like the people in my age range, you know, which I mean, I'm a little bit older than ta but like we're peers in that same range with people who got an actual shot. Um, and when it came to be partly because, largely because of Obama, I think Obama's existence shamed um, you know, publications, outlets, institutions um, into saying that you know, there are more black people living in the White House than there are working for our publication. And I think that changed the landscape of things. But I wonder how, how you all, um, who I think of as like my younger siblings um, in, in no condescending way, but I think of in that light, I wonder how you all view the landscape of the kind of work that's in this collection, if there's a more, a wider public um, audience for it, if there's more uh, understanding that this is a crucial strand of American life that has to be grappled with, or if you feel like you're still shouting into the wilderness, which is like something that a lot of us felt like, you know, for, for many years. Yeah. That's a great question. I think I definitely don't have a straight answer, but what, I think further complicates the situation for me as this notion of an, the idea of audience and how it's changed so much in the internet age. Mm. And so I think that um, sometimes it's hard for me to disambiguate between um, the like actual like solid mass of people who come across this anthology and read it with enthusiasm and curiosity and the people who I um, sort of like see online as like being responsive to it, but I don't necessarily know um, how much they are readers. I don't know if that's something that um, you ever think about, Vincent. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's interesting to have this conversation about sort of um, audience and this question of being receptive to certain voices when it's not a moment of crisis. It's, it, it's interesting to think about that in terms of an anthology because an anthology is, you know, I think when I think of anthologies, I think of posterity, right? Like mm. um, what was so flattering and moving to me uh, about being asked to be in this by a colleague who I um, admire so much, um, but also just the idea of being side by side with so many of the people that I admire and have admired. Um, it's like, what does it mean for like when I first started um, writing? I didn't know who Jervis Anderson was, and this this mm -hmm. amazing person who wrote biographies of Bayard Rustin and mm -hmm. Philip Randolph, and um, and then I looked into him, and like his profile of Wynton Marsalis puts forward everything I think about Wynton that like I didn't know somebody had thought all the thoughts about him already. You know? <laughs> um, just this, it seems like an effort to sort of. Um, uh, to, to in, in lack of a better term, like to, to remake canons, right? And that to me seems to be what mm. this act of anthologizing is. That's I think what the really like sort of radical gesture of, of, of this book is. Um, and, and yeah, the hope is that it, 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 it makes everybody zoom back, but there is a sort of, in some ways I, I share that distrust of like the, the moment might not be a moment of sort of, um, reflection of all that that takes but there is someone who will like will pick this up and will be assigned this book in such a way that will like reinscribe um what it means to be a magazine writer which it comes like a magazine the the it's a genre that we work in you know um, right and um even that 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 um uh that this that this medium it has been uh, sort of a way to get certain voices across, you know, it might change the way magazines are made and conceived of in the future. So I, I mean, my, my, my hopes, um, such as this sort of, this gesture is it lies maybe, you know, a little bit beyond um, the scope that we can see from right now. Um, but I mean, it's funny because like we came out one month, um, 1619 project came out the next month. And it was like this kind of groundswell of these conversations because, you know, the other thing is that a lot of the writing, and I don't want to be disrespectful to anyone, um, but a lot of the writing I think that preceded us, like in the time period when you would easily, when I was coming up, when you would every single month 
go to every single major publication and not see anyone of color in any, you could go through a month where, you know, between Vanity Fair, New Yorker, GQ, Vogue, um, every major title, there was not a single black person or even necessarily a person of color. And you could do that for a month after month after month. Um, and there was a point at which if a person was going to write about race, they had to do it in a very delicate, you know, compromised fashion, you know, as so as to not offend the delicate sensibilities of white readership. And I think that it was interesting too, is that people can actually say things um, that, I mean, I, my first two years at the New Yorker, I kept sending things to my editor, expecting them to say no. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna say this and there's gonna be a lot of people who are gonna be pissed off by it. And most of those people are gonna be white. And so I'd send it off and they'd be like, okay. And we'd go to fact check. I'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, and I think that's qualitatively different um, than that earlier period was. I love where this conversation is going, but I'm going to invite Jennifer to come back on and join us and see if the audience has some questions for you before we run out of time tonight. Are you there? Hi. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. I'm um, sorry it took a second for, for me to be brought back on screen, but um, what a fascinating conversation. Thank you all so much for sharing all of your um, wisdom and insights. And Kimberly, thank you for your uh, wonderful, as always, uh, moderating skills. Um, I'm going to jump in before we only have a couple of audience questions. So I'm going to um, invoke host privilege and ask a question of my own. And I'm going to encourage the audience to jump in and, and um, ask some questions while we take care of that. So uh, um, Kimberly represents the Amistad Center for Art and Culture. And and we're um, also co-hosting with the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center and the Mark Twain House. We're all in Hartford. And Jelani, you were saying earlier that you have some history in Hartford, that you actually spent some time living near us. I lived there for four that? years. Yeah, for four years. Yeah. And, I taught and, at University of Connecticut. So. And when was that? 2012 to 2016. And did you visit the Mark Twain House and the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center and the Wadsworth Athenaeum? The, yeah, I was there all <laughs> the time, like all the time. Uh, and so I lived on Owen Street. So oh, I was okay. like right there. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, very good. Well, I'm glad to, glad to clear that up. Um, <laughs> And I, I also just kind of wanted to talk, you were just talking about the, the, how the landscape has changed um, as far as uh, people of color appearing in these major publications. And, you know, the New Yorker in its inception was a very, very white um, mm. publication and um, it's changed dramatically. Um, can you talk a little bit, any of you, about how you feel about being part of that, um, about, uh, you know, I, don't, I won't belabor it, you know where I'm going, just to, how do you feel about being part of the, the um, kind of changing the New Yorker for yeah. the better? For, uh, I, I grew up all over New York, but if I have one neighborhood that is um, that I think of as my own, it's the Upper West Side, that's where my mother uh, still lives. And so um, I grew up surrounded by the New Yorker and much of the, the sort of, um, I don't know, culture that I associated with with it. And so um, I always, and luckily, and, and this is the thing that Jelani was talking about, about sort of like uh, generations and how they move. I, I sort of um, ate the fruit of orchard that I did not plant in that way. I always thought about it as a place that I could be. And I thought about the, you know, the to the extent that the New Yorker, yes, it's a national magazine. Yes, it's an international magazine, but to the extent that it has anything to do with New York, it was always a part of my New York. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I always felt um, a kind of affinity there. And then one thing that this anthology, um, and I'm sure you must've thought about this, putting this, putting it together, Delani, but even if you just read the table of contents, mm -hmm. one thing that um, really, you know, just thinking about New York and the sort of, Black internationalism that I associate with New York mm -hmm. um, is also just part and parcel of this um, magazine, of, of, of this magazine, yes, and of this anthology specifically. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, 
black American, my, my, all of my, you know, my grandparents and stuff are um, from the South, but there's, you know, if you think about, I, I mentioned Jarvis Anderson, a Jamaican American, mm -hmm. um, Antiguan American, Jamaican Kincaid, who is, mm -hmm. if, if I have a New Yorker hero, that's who it is. Um, Hilton Alls from Barbados, his, his family is from Barbados. Like you just think about the, the sort of, Zadie Smith is in here from Britain, the, the black internationalism, the sort of, mm -hmm. one of the, the pressures that gets released, the more, um, the more voices are heard, the more you see that there's a diversity of approaches even within the sort of figure of the black writer in a sort of largely right. white magazine, you know, that that pressure of representation gives way to something much more, um, the, the, you know, the neighborhood, Flatbush, Brooklyn, where Dorian and, and I both live, it's like, that's what I feel when I walk out. And that's one of the, um, when I walk outside that, um, you know, um, that intra-black diversity um, and yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's present in this volume. Yeah, that was, that was, we were very um, cognizant of that, you know, and just thinking about it and, you know, all of the different communities. And then like Hilton, <laughs> of all the people we had to kind of call it was Hilton um, because that could easily have turned into the, the Hilton Owls reader <laughs> um, because we had so much <laughs> Hilton stuff in there. But as it, as it turned out, we ended the, his is the last piece in the collection. And so Baldwin opens it and Hilton closes it. And we felt like that was a great bookend. Well, Doreen, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I think I can speak um, very quickly to having joined the New, York, New Yorker as a writer for the website initially. Now I write the television column in the magazine, but I think something that is really undersung in the history of the institution is how much work the website separate from the magazine puts out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We, as a, you know, compared to our peers, our newsroom is incredibly small. <laughs> you know, this is not like the times that's like this, like, you know, palace. Um, and so I think joining the website was really fascinating because initially there was a sense that certain stories would be saved for the print magazine. Um, and now the website puts us in a kind of like diurnal daily conversation. Um, that was like really critical to my developing my identity as someone who publishes um, with the institution. And now, you know, the story that Jelani chose for the anthology, that review of the Kendrick Lamar concert was actually a wet piece, right? And um, it wouldn't have had a home in the magazine per se in the way that the magazine is structured every week. And so we're able to sort of like expand the birth of the coverage that we can do because we just have this kind of like infinite space in the form of the website. That's a really interesting point. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Can um, I tell you like a funny moment? Um, I was in the office. This was back when we did such things. It was such reckless abandon as like hang out in person. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in the office and I, I always would like make the rounds kind of walk by everyone's desk. Um, and so I stopped by Khalifa's desk, uh, Khalifa Sana. And uh, so I was there, you know, talking with him. And then um, Hilton Owls came by. He was on his way. Or he was probably making rounds too. And so the three of us were uh, in this office talking. And I just was like, look, it's the black kids' table in the lunchroom. Um, <laughs> it's like, all of us in one place. And I was like, this is like amazing that we're here and we have like this kind of diversity of thought, you know, um, and diversity of kind of backgrounds and perspectives. Um, and we're all technically under the rubric of black writers. But I, I think to um, the point that Vincent made, it was really the most important thing is that we're getting away from the idea of there being this singular um, voice. Mm -hmm. Lauren and Vincent, both of you being contemporaries and both living in the same, same very, very close um, proximity in the neighborhood, um, both writing for The New Yorker, both writing about Black culture, um, were you aware of each other's writings before you um, joined The New Yorker staff? I, I was very aware of during that. I'll never forget. She uh, wrote a piece for the, uh, it was a newsletter, Lenny Letter. It was about um, one of my favorite writers, June Jordan. Oh, wow. oh right. And I, I remember just being like, <laughs> I, I want to read this person forever. Um, uh -huh. um, I think and, I felt, 
Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to no, interrupt no, no, no. you. Uh, Praising me, continue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was very aware of Doreen, and I've always considered her like somebody that I'm like, I don't, I don't envision people when I write, but then I, when, when later on I think about people that I like, I hope will like it. Doreen is always like in that cloud. It's Can I tell funny. you my, my favorite Doreen story? So we're oh, like completely no. embarrassed right now. Like I, I brought Doreen. <laughs> I brought Doreen to my class one time at Columbia and I was teaching a writing class. Uh, and, you know, there were all these questions, you know, we always bring like colleagues in to talk to people. And at the end, you know, someone raised a question which I was like surprised to hear, but they said, uh, excuse me, how old are you? And I believe you were 26 at the time and you said it. And I, there was this palpable wave of hatred. <laughs> 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 no, it's just not fair. How is she that good, that young? <laughs> oh, I'm a secret, secretly still in my 20s. Um, but yeah, I came across, thank you so much for making me embarrassed um, by complimenting me. But I came across, I mean, Jelani's writing, I actually studied when I was in school. And I remember because I was studying under Professor Trisha Rose, who oh, is okay. the inventor of hip hop mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was in college and we were all reeling after mm -hmm. the killing of Trayvon. And mm -hmm. I was in a, I think it was like a Black Feminism 101 studies mm -hmm. class. And I, at before then, I had not been familiar with The New Yorker. I grew up in New York, but I grew up in Canarsie with a bunch of Haitians who kind of were barely fluent in English. And the magazine at that point wasn't even really available in the neighborhood that I grew up in, which I think is really interesting. Um, now that's not the case. So Jelani was actually my introduction to The New Yorker. Oh, wow. And um, Vincent, I remember it was your piece in New York Magazine on Baldwin and Coates. Mm. And I remember texting with our mutual friend Jasmine and I was like, there's a new black intellectual in the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all have each other's phone numbers. <laughs> right. And I think something that I want to emphasize too when Jelani's talking about diversity of voices that um, also goes to the mediums that we cover. Uh, I think it's really important that for, you know, at this point, I don't know how many years, maybe two decades, the theater critic at the New Yorker has been a black man. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a historically white institution. It matters that someone like Alls was bringing his um, knowledge of race to the way that people processed um, Shepard or Sondheim. So I think it's, that shift is something that's been happening later in the magazine where you were having um, critics of so-called marginalized identities, um, sort of like assuming these tenuously authoritative positions and sort of bringing their um, histories to the way that they view these works. And I think um, that's something that people, I think don't always know about the magazine because we're kind of like faceless bylines, um, but that's, yeah, I just wanted to, to highlight that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I want to get this gang back together uh, over and over again, because it's just so, it's so, um, everything's so fascinating, particularly for a lifelong New Yorker junkie like myself, the insights into the inner workings of the New Yorker are <laughs> fascinating. Um, our audience member, Nancy Dunn, um, has a question for Doreen and another one for Vincent. So I, I'm going to fire them both out. Uh, Doreen, uh, can you say more about the guardrails you set up to keep from spiraling? Um, are the guardrails about clear thinking or more about productivity? And do you set different guardrails when you're writing something without an explicit deadline? Um, so I actually, in my writing career, have pretty much always been a deadline writer because I mostly have just been a critic, a beat critic, or maybe more of a roving position before turning to television. I think for me, it's important to have something on the page um, rather than not having anything on the page. And I know that that sounds kind of trite, but it is true that um, there's something about having the regular rhythm and sharpening um, your responsive muscles that I think is like extremely important to being a critic. You know, it's so easy to sort of say, well, I'm not going to respond to this phenomenon yet because it's not either worthy of my phenomenon or I think the thinking needs to mature to ripen. But um, there's a way in, in which 
each piece is kind of adding to uh, an aggregation of an argument that you're making about the medium that you're writing about. So for me right now, mm. that's television, whereas for Vincent, that's often theater, sometimes books, religion. Um, so yeah, that's what I mean. It's about um, making sure that the piece exists, which is something that I think sounds self-evident, but can be very difficult for writers, Ooh. especially at a magazine where you can sometimes work ad infinitum on a story. That was a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> and Vincent, Nancy wants to know from you, do you have a phenomenon or phenomena that you're observing right now that you can't wait to synthesize? Oh, boy. Um, oh, that's really it. I'm, Thanks, Nancy, for your good question. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, I'm really fascinated, and this is like part of um, this is partially because of my interest in theater, um, and it seems to me like there's a lot more um, direct address of different kinds happening in theater. Um, I've always hated the sort of writing um, advice of show don't tell. I think like telling is actually really important and interesting and I like to <laughs> I grew up uh in a very religious household and um so every Sunday I was like told stuff like I like the the mm -hmm. form and function of the sermon like somebody telling you and that being a, a, an artistic gesture and that being something that it takes a, a lot of craft to learn how to do is tell and convince and, and bring along I see that happening more everywhere and I just kind of like I've had it in my mind um a piece about like direct address. And this also goes to my like um, deep, I mean, the pandemic has been like an explosion of like bad TV for me. So I watch all these shows that I didn't watch before, like, you know, 90 Day Fiance and things like this, like <laughs> things that are supposed to be real, but actually depend on um, a weird kind of winking direct address to get themselves across. I just like want to write something about that. Um, and the other thing, like the biggest, like I, I've lived in the city most of my life and um, and always just detested and avoided Times Square. And I'm, all, I'm there all the time now because I have to go to uh, the theater. And so like, I, I, at some point I also just wanna like more for myself than anybody else, like figure out what, how I feel about Times Square. I don't know if that's an essay of like, I don't know if I need to wait for a book and just like review a book about Times Square. I don't know what it is, but I wanna write about Times Square. And did you experience Times Square before it was the family friendly place that it is today? Um, it sort of was, it's, it's weird because like my, the short amount of time that I did live away from the city except for college and stuff was when I was a kid from three to nine, we lived in Chicago. Um, and so when I was coming back to the city as a nine year old was like the middle of of Giuliani, it was like 94, or whatever, like peak Giuliani. So it was like the moment when it was like the last bit of the old um, Times Square was kind of being shunted aside. The last um, peep show? The last, exactly, <laughs> that's the name of the piece, the last peep show. Um, Samuel, uh, Samuel R. Delaney, a great, great writer, mm -hmm. has a, a great, uh, great book that's called Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, and it's about yeah. sort of, um, uh, the Disneyfication of Times Square and the um, the consequent like um, erasure of what he talks about these points of contact that there were many points of contact that existed in that space many of them sexual many of them like illicit you know but actually that this was a, a, a sort of effective web that in some ways brought the whole city together that like got cleared out and I've like I've, ever since I read that book I've been like obsessed with that idea and um, cause I just thought of it as a place to like stand under the McDonald's awning and like try to talk to girls, which is like what we did, but it, it was not the same. Oh. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you again, Nancy, for your good questions. Well, it's getting close to time to, to wind down. I just, I think I'd like to, um, uh, I think Kimberly and I both would uh, join in wanting to give each of you just a moment to say one final thing. Um, so Jelani, Doreen and Vincent, is there anything you'd like to, uh, say to, I have questions. two words for you, supply chain. <laughs> as you are all, as you are all no doubt 
wondering um, and pondering and worrying about whether or not that gift you really want to get is going to get there in time, or if the, the suppliers will be out of stock, I can only tell you that we have many of these. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Christmas gift that you need. Uh, and if you, even if it's not, just get one as a backup gift in case that one doesn't get there. And so this is my you know, sales pitch for the matter of Black Lives. You get to read uh, even more amazing work, hear the perspectives of my uh, brilliant colleagues here. Uh, so you know, go out and buy yours right now. And buy yourself a copy. You deserve and buy yourself a, a, a gift. Copy. So uh, yes. <laughs> well, time well spent there, Jelani. Doreen, have you anything you'd like to say? Um, well, firstly, I'd love to thank Jelani for this undertaking, as Vincent said, strange word for me to use. <laughs> but uh, I think I, I think of the building of this canon as being in dialogue with there's this great film researcher, her name is Maya Cade, and she recently compiled um, a searchable website that has every black film that was ever made. Wow. So by black film, we mean a film that was directed by a black person, mm -hmm. going back to the silent films, um, Oscar Michaud, of the early 20th century. And in searching through that archive, you know, I came across films that I know that Baldwin would have watched in the talkie theaters in, the, in Harlem in the 40s and 50s. And so I would invite everyone to, as you're going through this archive, also visit the Black Film Archive. Um, you know, we are the interpreters of art. Um, but I also invite you to go through that uh, incredible collection of the kind of art that it is that we respond to. Thank you, Doreen, fascinating. And Vincent, how about you? I, I just wanna say again, um, first of all, thanks to you for hosting us. This has been lovely, but also just um, thanks to Jelani. It's, uh, th this, um, this book is, I've always thought of, my, of myself in, in relation to the New Yorker and in relation to my writing as like just, uh, trying to learn and trying to get better at writing, and so this this uh, this book is a, a resource for me in that. I was I always think of like, you know, jazz musicians shedding, like just trying mm -hmm. to like play mm -hmm. play notes better than they did last time. And this is like this book is like a a, a woodshed for me, and so I'm just mm -hmm. so um, like I can't even think about the fact that I'm in it. It makes no sense. Um, and uh, to 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 be there with with you and with Doreen is just it's, you know, it's wonderful. So thank you. Well, thank you all. Jelani, Doreen, and Vincent, thank you so much. And Kimberly, thank you for your doing uh, your uh, awesome job as always. And I want to thank uh, the Amistad Center for Art and Culture and the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center for joining the Mark Twain House and Museum and sponsoring tonight's program. Uh, Jelani, Doreen, and Vincent, please don't be strangers. Um, we'd love to have you come. You know, I always say that the Mark Twain House is a writer's home and a home for writers. And you're all now members of our big growing family of writers. So we hope to see you here sometime um, and uh, give you the grand tour. And if if you have not yet clicked that link, audience members, to purchase uh, The Matter of Black Lives, signed by Jelani Cobb. I don't know what, what you're waiting for. Um, please go ahead and do that. And to all of you who have um, donated to us this evening, thank you very much for that. Um, and um, with that, I'll, I'll say good night to everybody, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Good night. Good to meet you all. Thanks. Good have night. a good holiday season. You too.